All right, all right. What's good, party people? It is your boy BQ. Welcome back to the most negative channel on the planet. This is your Impact Lounge TNA Rebellion review for 2024. I would have loved to do this review directly after the show, after I got home, but I ended up having to work. So that wasn't going to be a thing. Um, and then I tried to do it in the morning, and that didn't work. So here I am. All right. So uh, we're, we're, you know, 24 hours removed right from the show. So not, not a bad turnaround time. People were asking for my thoughts on Rebellion. Um, if it's your first time here, this is the number one place to be for TNA. So, you know, hit that subscribe button. Uh, good content as much as humanly possible. But uh, people were asking for my review. Couldn't wait to see what my experience was. So I was there. Uh, if you saw the show, you saw me. I, I already know I was on TV multiple times. I don't like to be on TV. That's why I sat on that side. But um, that's that's what happened. You know, I sat <laughs> on the same side as the hard cam, not facing it, so that I wasn't um, uh, constantly being shown. But I mean, they they had me with it. You know, minutes into this fucking show, so all good is whatever. Um, <laughs> I got a lot of messages about it. Um, some just, you know, podcast listeners and some just wrestling fans who are my friends who don't really necessarily know I podcast, but they, you know, they watch it and everything. So um, it was a great experience. I will say um, my love for the company is always regenerated every time I go to a live event. When I first started podcasting, I would go to the Impact Lounge in Orlando every several months. Uh, I would make, you know, I, I drove to WrestleCon to the Lucha Underground versus Impact show, which I hated. Uh, I'm trying to think over the years, I have done some pay-per-views, you know, Bound for Glory in Chicago. Uh, if it was something I could travel to, I would do my absolute best. I made a promise to myself, though, that I would not attend a live Impact Wrestling or TNA show until they got rid of We Own the Night. Now that they did, I can just attend these shows. Now they do play cross the line between every freaking match, but it's not an annoying song. So that's not that big of a deal to me. You know what I mean? It, that just sounds more like background music. Uh, it is not We Own the Night. It is not even freaking close. But it was a great experience. Had, a, had an absolute blast. I think people forget that I love this company. I just get so frustrated. I have very high standards for them, very high hopes. And sometimes it's a bit of, bit of a joke for me to, put, to, to point fun at them. But I have a similar personality where I point fun at myself a lot. Point the right word, poke fun at myself a lot. Uh, so I kind of poke fun at the company, but I'm very protective of it at the same time. Like You're not going to see me joining in on people hating on the company on a Facebook forum or something like you're going to see me, yo, you know, step up, shut the fuck up that type of dude. Um, but I, I just have very high standards for the company so I can get very frustrated. And when you're in a position like myself where you're podcasting for years, you know, it's cute in the beginning, like, Oh man, if they, if they did this little thing better, you know, this and this, and then, it's like four or five years later and you're still saying the same thing, it can get very frustrating. But as I said, every time that I attend in person, my love grows a little bit more. I have a an appreciation for wrestlers that I don't necessarily, uh, or I have, in, in I guess in the past, said that I didn't necessarily care for them. You know? So like, like example, you know, we met ABC. Uh, there were, you know, and and it's not like that. I like dislike them, but I just don't enjoy a lot of tag team wrestling. That's, that's just like clearly a bunch of pre rehearsed spots and that type of stuff. So their matches weren't a, like a priority for me. I was always like, oh, the match was okay, you know. But you know, met the guys and they were super nice. Uh, Chris Bay is not super nice on Twitter, you know. <laughs> Like you tweeted him, he will, 
he doesn't give you the warmest responses in the world. Uh, but they were very nice in person. I've obviously stated many, many times that I'm not like PCO's biggest fan. And it's not even like, I actually kind of like the PCO character. It's the use of PCO. That's what I'm not a fan of. Uh, he was extremely nice. Everyone, everyone really was, you know what I mean? And um, I think seeing Ace Austin and Chris Bay wrestle in person, you know, I have a, a better appreciation for them. I said the same thing with Josh Alexander, watching him wrestle Hammerstone and who was his other match? Uh, Osprey, seeing that live. I just had a new appreciation for him seeing it in person. So, and it kind of goes like that for the majority of the roster in all honesty, you know? So it does rejuvenate me. I've been, uh, I've been, uh, asked. So, so I, <laughs> I kind of reestablished some, some contacts within the company, you could say. And I've been asked to get clarification on things and not to be afraid to ask questions before kind of speak my opinions without knowing, um, what really happened. Or I've been asked to do a better job of just having the mindset that things happen for a reason, you know, that things aren't completely out of left field, that things happen for a reason. Uh, and to just, you know, change my tune overall a little bit. Right. <laughs> so, um, if you've seen a pattern, there's been a pattern with me. When I go to a show, I typically have a much more positive attitude for, a couple months and then I kind of settle back into my own way, my old ways where they're pissing me off, you know? <laughs> so I'm, I'm feeling good right now. I'm feeling good after rebellion. I am feeling good about after the tapings just came back from that. I'm going to hit pause one second to bring my dogs in. All right. I'm back. Sorry about that, but I have been given the green light to, to seek clarification to ask questions, uh, won't always get thing, get an answer right away, but to ask questions. And I do have a responsibility to, and I know this, I wasn't told this, but I'm saying this. I have a responsibility to communicate things to the TNA audience because I know you guys spend a greater time of on, on social media than I do. You know, I'm real, like, I've been spending a lot of time on Twitter the last uh, three or four days, but, like, for the most part, I'm not on, I don't talk about wrestling a whole lot in my day, you know, and there's many more of you who do, so when I spread the word, I mean, when I get some clarification on something, you guys are good enough to spread the word, you know what I mean? Like, you guys all do an excellent job, so I do have a responsibility to get to the bottom of stuff a little bit, so now that I have uh open lines of communication with the company again you know hopefully we can change things up a little bit here at the channel as far as how it operates and the kind of news that i'm able to get out there it is communicated to me when something's off the record though you know so there are things that have been said to me that i can't repeat and i don't repeat won't repeat but there's things that i i know that i can like i can tell you you know, there is internal frustration with the, in the company that the, the production value has not increased, you know, cause that's been one of my things. Right. Uh, so I've always kind of, what have I been saying lately? The company does not care. Right. <laughs> I said, they don't care. That's just a strong opinion I've had because I said, I said, if they did care, it would have been fixed. Right. Well, you know, I now know that there is internal frustration as far as that goes. That's not may not stop me from pointing out when something looks horrible, but I'm going to try to not give them such a hard time, you know. But let's let's talk rebellion here. Uh, well, even before rebellion, I uh, just finished the set the tapings for the day. They a couple of the matches advertised, I feel like weren't done i know the pco match didn't happen because that was against matt cardona and he was hurt so that wasn't even replaced with anything um i'm trying to think what else that i i there's definitely one or two others that i remember seeing graphics for and, and i didn't see 
And uh, the majority of the matches that they advertised, I think, were for the the next uh, the the third and fourth episode. So the first and second episode, I think, were a little more. Of us, they're not surprises, but I, I didn't know what the matches were. I'll just throw it like that. I'll put it like that. I did not know what the matches were. But once that first two days of tapings was done and it got into three and four, I kind of knew what the matches were. I'd seen them on social media. There was some really good wrestling in them. Um, there was a couple matches I didn't. There was like probably two that I was I really could have done without. Uh, one was an advertised match, which was Jordan Grace versus the uh, the girl from Japan. I could have I could have done without that. I'll get to more. I'll, I'll do more. I'll talk more about that when it happens because I don't. I'm not like a spoiler dude. Uh, but but I'll say there was nothing major that happened. You know, there's no there's no deep spoilers within this. Where like oh, this person showed up and and all that 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 didn't happen. It, but it was uh, two excellent nights of wrestling and. Um, I will say, I think they said they sold 800 tickets or so. I don't think there was that many people there, but it was close. I'll say it was close. As the time as time moved on, it was it was like open seating, which uh, was kind of a waste of money for me because I bought general admission tickets. But veterans can get cheap tickets, get free tickets. They just they always suck. Like they're they're like at the very top. You know what I mean? They're not like good tickets necessarily. But now that I know it's open seating for stuff like that, I probably won't pay for the general admission tickets. Uh, but yeah, you know, we pretty much got to sit wherever we wanted because they wanted uh, the uh, the crowd to look fuller. And there was one part in when it got to days three and four of taping that, you know, someone was coming down the aisle like, hey, anyone want to move to the camera side? We're, we're filling it up a little bit there. And most people said no because they were just kind of comfortable. They were sitting, but there was a there was a group that got up and uh, and filled some of the seats down there. And as far as the attendance for Rebellion goes, I know they had it at eighteen hundred or something. I don't remember exactly what the number was, where they said it was a sellout. Like it wasn't. Maybe maybe on paper it was, as far as tickets distributed, but it wasn't. I promise you, there was um there was definitely a couple hundred empty seats. It was full. I mean, it was full. Let me not paint a picture that there was no one there. It was it was full. When I say a couple hundred, I mean they were just scattered throughout the the arena. It wasn't it wasn't um you know big giant chunks. It was you know onesie twosie seats here or there. But they did move up because uh, some of the people I sat next to in general admission the the next night because I didn't want to pay for ringside two nights in a row. It's like for me and my kids, like it's it's kind of a lot of money. But some of the people I talked to said that they were. You know, they were sitting towards the top or whatever, and they and people said, hey, come forward. So they were able to fill in a little bit and um, and all that. So because I know there's a lot of you out there, you're going to defend it. Oh, it was it was a sellout. Like, again, maybe on paper it was maybe maybe the tickets were all distributed, but it was not packed the way that Hard to Kill was. It was very close to it. It was, it was very close to it, but but it was it was not the same. So. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's talk. Let me get a, get me some more grape crush here real quick. Mm. My destiny has been fulfilled. I've got my Alicia Edwards autograph photo. Finally got to meet Alicia Edwards and got a photo with her. So that was awesome. Who did I meet? Who did I meet before I get into rebellion? I know I keep saying I'm going to get into it. Um, Alicia. Uh, the first night we just, we just got a couple because I was, I was talking to someone uh, from the company after the show for a while. And, uh, a lot of the meeting, <laughs> meet and greet was, was over by the time. So we, we got Alicia, um, the fuck else we got the first night. My kids got Joe Hendry, uh, Moose. I think that was it. I feel like there was one more and I just can't moose was one that escaped us for a long time. We never had an opportunity to meet moose finally, finally, finally. But today we did PCO who again was like really nice spitfire <laughs> who were very nice as well. I know I'm not a big fan of their, them as champions, but they were very cool. Um, Ash was great. 
Josh Alexander, Steve Macklin. Paid for Zay Brookside and Jake something and Laredo Kid, and they all bounced before he could get to him, so I had to get refunds. Um, Decay. I feel like, man, I feel like that first night there was one more. It's just escaping me. Can't think of the hell it is. Um, maybe it'll come back to me. But yeah, okay. So let's move on from that. But yeah, I got my Alicia Edward Edwards photo. The boyhood dream has been realized. And uh, that was a big highlight for me. So let's get into this. Let's finally get into this. I've been talking and talking and this and this and this. Um, Pre-show, pre-show. This match was so much more entertaining than I thought it was going to be. No, let me me rephrase that. I knew it was going to be entertaining. But the more people you add into a match, the, the less I'm interested. So this was a six six man tag, which was ABC and Leon Slater versus uh, the Rascals and Myron Reed. But this was, you guys already know because you saw this. Even if you couldn't watch the pay per view, um, I know not everyone could afford it. I hope you were not like the dude um, who was begging people on Twitter to order the pay per view for him because he got. Fired from a fast food chain that that uh, famously fires nobody. You know what I mean. So there's like nowhere to go. You can't. There's nowhere to go but down from there. You feel me? So at least you guys, uh, people who listen to me, are not like that uh, out there begging people who work hard for their money to uh, for charity. But yeah, the opening match uh, was so much more uh, entertaining for me as a person than. I thought it was going to be. And it's probably one of those things, again, like the live experience. It's just uh, very, very different than watching uh, watching on TV. But I actually expected the Rascals to win this match. It surprised me that they didn't um, because I thought they were going to start teasing dissension with ABC. And they didn't. And I didn't really see that otherwise. So if if that's happening, it's being done kind of in backstage angles and all that, but you know, everything was a uh, well-oiled machine and this was um, an excellent match. And I, I, man, I really hope that Myron Reed, you know, kind of going for, I know my dogs are going to bark here in a second. I can feel it. I know it's actually my cat's fighting. Um, he's an asset. He's an asset to the company. I hope that he remains with them going forward and a part of the rascals and in the tapings, he was with them for the most part. I think there was Trey Miguel had a singles match that he wasn't there for. Um, and then Wentz wrestled an explosion, and I don't remember if Myron Reed was there. I know when he's by himself, they're with him. But but if it's one of them wrestling, I'm not positive that he was with them. So great opening match, great opening match. Ace Austin, Chris Bay, and Leon Slater won. They got something in Leon Slater too. When they announced that he was assigning, uh, you know, those of you who really follow. The indies were like, yo, this dude's on point. I had never heard of him, seen him, but I have seen him now. And uh, the kid is very good. Digital Media Championship, Laredo Kid versus Crazy Steve. I was pretty sure Laredo Kid was winning this thing, and he did. The majority of the crowd wanted Crazy Steve to win. I mean, there were some people supporting Laredo Kid, but for the most part, uh, I think Crazy Steve was a more popular wrestler. And um, this was a little better than I expected it to be because I didn't really like the episode, the the match they had on the episode of Impact. So it, it wasn't too bad. I did not expect Crazy Steve to win. It was Laredo Kid. I'm a little worried about this title going forward because I don't see Laredo Kid having this excellent run with the title. I don't see him elevating it. Uh, I mean, he put the belt down and celebrated like Cody Rhodes winning the world championship at WrestleMania. I mean, it was a little much for me. I don't think this title means a whole lot. I think it's going to mean less here over the next couple months, but maybe this means the Rado kid gets a little bit of a run. You know, we haven't seen that yet. So let's see, let's see what he can do. Let's see what the Rado kid can do. The other match they have there, the very popular Havoc taking, or Havoc, <laughs> very popular Decay taking on uh, Jody Threat and Danny Luna, Spitfire for the tag team championships. 
I was pretty sure that Spitfire was winning this thing. I mean, uh, Lars Fredrickson, uh, Fredrickson came down with him. Um, it just, you just know, like when you have like a, a celebrity come down with you, like typically it means that team is going to win. This was just, uh, the, what, what do they call it? What does Tom Hannafin call it? The contractual rematch, uh, for the title. That's what this was. They were getting this out of the way so they could kind of move on to an actual storyline. Uh, but, but this was okay. Rosemary, my kids were like, Rosemary got her ass kicked a lot in this match, and she kind of did. Uh, Havoc was doing <laughs> a good a good portion of the work. Jody Thread and Danny Luda pretty committed to to their look and their their style as a tag team, so um, not a not a bad match. And then we got uh, the official Rebellion pay per view kicking off, and there was a couple of protest. Excuse me. Whoa, there's a big yawn. So we have crush for the working man, right, Mike? All right. Um, there was a couple protesters because they are protesting Jake something size being in the X division. Ali basically thinks it's supposed to be a cruiserweight division. I think it should be a cruiserweight division personally. Mustafa Ali won this match. This was one of the better matches on the show. There was no, there was no doubt in my mind Jake was losing here. But I also said that Jake will be the person to ultimately take the belt off Mustafa Ali. He ultimately will be that dude. I feel pretty good about that. I don't know how long Ali, excuse me. Whew, I don't know how much longer Ali's going to be around, but Jake did say he's winning the X Division Championship this year. Usually when someone says something like that, it comes to fruition. Jake something is going to finish the story. So this, this ended by Ali cheating to win. He was holding, he held the bottom ropes or the bottom rope, I should say. And uh, he got the win. This definitely sets up that these guys will, will meet again down the line at some point. I'm not under the impression, given the tapings, that they continue their feud right now. So I think it's something they're going to kick down. They're going to kick that can down the road a little bit and revisit it. But I think Jake will ultimately beat him. I hope in that in that time frame, they can find a way to make Jake's on screen character a little bit more interesting because his character is like that he's a pro wrestler. You know that he's just a big guy that looks and acts like a pro wrestler. I mean, I don't know that that's what they're going for, but I'm just saying that's how it comes across on TV. He's always in his underwear. You know, he never has a shirt on um, or any kind of, he just always looks like he's ready to wrestle. I pointed it out actually at Hard to Kill in the beginning when Eric Young came and did this opening monologue. Like everyone was in some kind of jacket or shirt or or something, except Jake something was just out there in his wrestling gear. You know, it <laughs> just, they, I think they have to find a way to update his presentation. I'm probably going to, hammer that home over the next couple months uh, that I that I truly feel that way. Rich Swan took on Joe Hendry and beat Joe Hendry. I'm a first class guy. I was cheering for first class. Yes, they asked me did I put my hands up for Joe Hendry? I did because you do got to be a bit of a wrestling mark if you're going to sit in the front row, you know. Um so yeah, my hands were up a little. AJ Francis uh, I saw him right before we left today and he's like, um, I saw you guys putting your hands up for Joe Hendry chanting. We believe I was like, Oh no, 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 that was the kids. I'm all first class, but yes, I did. I did, uh, cheer for Joe Hendry a little bit. We just met AJ two weeks ago. So he recognized this. That's, that's where that, that came down from. Um, but rich Swan won like I was hoping he was, I'm so embarrassed because um, Sean Merriman was court, uh, courtside, ringside, and he got involved. And he, you know, he hit Joe Hendry with a pretty solid looking clothesline. This wasn't like the clothesline that the swole mates hit Eli Drake on Pop TV once upon a time with. Like it was pretty legit. But I was embarrassed because he was a San Diego Charger, and I didn't know who he was. And I'm a Chargers fan. I was explaining, um, 
<laughs> I've explained to a, a, a few people. So basketball is my main sport. You can pretty much show me any player I know who I know who they are. I'm a I'm a I'm a mark for basketball, NBA and WNBA. I'm a mark for basketball. Football is like my secondary. Um, it's kind of it's kind of a, a distant secondary, and that doesn't mean I'm, I'm I'm unknowledgeable. That's not what I'm saying. It doesn't mean I'm some like casual fucking fan. What I'm just saying is I don't recognize more than half a percent of the players if they don't have. I didn't word that very well. I recognize. I facially recognize less than one percent of the players. I just know what people look like with their helmet on. And their jersey, their name. Like when they were, you know, a couple years ago where, the, hey, the Chargers got Khalil Mack. Awesome. Couldn't pick him out of a lineup. You know, <laughs> that's the kind of football fan I am. I just, I really don't recognize the majority of the players. So uh, I felt, I did feel kind of, you know, foolish that he's from my team. But, you know, admittingly, I tell people that all the time. You know, it's not just me saying it on the podcast here. I was like, dude, I don't know what any freaking players look like unless there's someone that ESPN cannot stop talking about or they're in uh, they're on social media for, for whatever reason, like obviously Travis Kelsey, we all know what he looks like. Um, but most players I don't. <laughs> so I just knew he was this big Jack dude at ringside. I knew he was going to get involved. It was, I was just like, dude, that is not some wrestling fan. I just, I just knew that there was some shenanigans in this, but I was okay with it because it gave rich Swan a win. So I was okay with it. I, uh, he hit a really nice frog splash at the end. I can tell you guys this feud continues. It is never ending. It will never end. Um, it, it will go on forever until um, my children have small children of their own. Uh, first class will be feuding with Joe Hendry. So the right guy won here. And... Uh, I, I guess what I can say, I don't believe this was said, was something I couldn't say. Um, we're going to see a lot more celebrities, athletes, TikTokers on screen going forward. I don't think just with the pay-per-view, because Bun B was at the tapings. I mean, that's already been thrown out there on social media. He was part of the show. We're going to see a lot more of that going forward. But do not confuse that with the celebrities are going to get in the ring and wrestle or they're going to always, I know we saw Sean Merriman hit the clothesline, but that I'm under the impression that's not going to be the norm, but just to better tap into pop culture um, and, and just look like a bigger deal on screen, you're going to see a lot more of it. And I think it works because there, there was a strong celebrity presence presence at this show. Usually when TNA is like, Hey, there's a celebrity at the show. It's Gail Kim's husband. Or they had to do from 98 degrees, which was random as hell. Uh, that was that was the at Snake Eyes. That was that was super random. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Yeah, West Side Gun was there, Smoke Dizza, um, several athletes, you know. We're gonna see more of that going forward uh, to legitimize the show. But that doesn't mean like West Side Gun's going to hop the rail and, you know, interfere, you know, get the pull the X down during Ultimate X or something. It's not it's not going to be like that. Full Metal Mayhem. This was was great as well. What it was. We'll get to that. Full Metal Mayhem was Frankie Kazarian and Eric Young. I know there's been some rumblings that EY might be going back to WWE. I don't know if it's even rumblings or just people making assumptions without any information i have no clue i just heard i've just heard the possibility he goes back to be a, be a producer or something like that this um frankie kazarian was doing a lot of cursing in this match yelling at the crowd yelling at whoever the goof referee frank uh was counting when they were outside the ring and frankie kazarian just turns up i don't know if it came up on screens like what are you gonna do count me out you son of a bitch there's no rules <laughs> So that was that was pretty funny, um, but these are two guys that, as I always say, can work. And there's something about Full Metal Mayhem for me where I don't view it as a normal street fight garbage match. I don't know. Is it the ladder? Is it they throw the ladder in there? I don't really know. Or maybe I just have good memories of the Hardys Full Metal Mayhem, which I thought was 
was awesome. The uh, the Full Metal Mayhem that was like Davy Richards and Angelina Love against Alicia and Eddie. You know, I just, I just, there's, I, there's matches in my past that I like, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily turned off when they say something is is Full Metal Mayhem. Eric Young at the very end. What was the move? Let me see if it's in the in the says. Uh, oh, he did a flex capacitor, but it was off the second rope on, in, onto the table. I don't know how it showed up on TV. I, I, I don't know. They did not go through the center of the table. They freaking did not. I mean, Eric Young's head was like the very edge of that table. And he was busted open like a stuffed pig and you know was walking around with a full bandage on his head after that. He did make one appearance on the show. So he's not like clear to wrestle, wrestle, but he he made he made an appearance on the show um, afterwards. So he's not like completely written off TV by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, I guess he did have to go to the ER. But he he took a he took a good he took a good gash. I after Frankie Gazarian saw the match, I could see in his eyes he was a little concerned with him, but he was trying to stay in character as well. But I I know that he probably felt very bad for that. Then Steve Macklin came out with his contract. It's a contract. I'm going to put it in quotes because being that close, I can tell you it was a cover page and then one singular page after that. So there, there ain't nothing in there about my demands and <laughs> all that shit, you know? Um, so clearly it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fake contract, but looks like, uh, he is going to be back. He is, he is resigning. So thank, thank God. Um, we met Macklin tonight. Did I say Macklin already? Yeah. We met Macklin too. And then this the, we got Santino coming out. What do you call him? Uh, McLean. <laughs> Let him know that he's got an opponent for him. Uh, someone that he just signed and it was no surprises. Mike San. Santana. If you haven't caught Mike Santana, I don't even know. I just saw it on Facebook. He cut a promo after the match, which was phenomenal. It just lets you know that this this dude is going to be a major player in this company. Um, but the match with Macklin was was really good too. Mike Santana very much over. He's coming through the crowd just like LAX. He had a uh, moment where he tried to stand on a barricade <laughs> when he first and he he pushed himself up and he kind of missed and had to do it a second time. That reminds me, I don't know if it came up on screen when there was the uh, the protesters. One of them tripped real bad entering the ring, and he, thank God, caught himself. But he was he was a second away from eating shit on screen in front of everyone because his foot got caught up in the rope when he walked in. It was it was almost like the Batista when he came in the rope the ring that one time and completely ate shit. That's what I thought was going to happen. But this match was impromptu. We weren't expecting it. Uh, and we got something we probably didn't deserve because it was a really good match. And Mike Santana wins with uh, discus clothesline. And um, it, it, dude, it, it was very competitive. I didn't think like Steve Macklin looked weak in the loss. I wouldn't. I would have liked that he won. I don't really want him on the show if he's going to lose. But um, I think this over match was very, very much over with the audience. Then we got Brian Myers and Eddie Edwards from the system defending the tag team titles against Speedball Mountain, Cheeseball Mountain, um, Mike Bailey, Trent Seven, uh, Teabag Mountain. So this was uh, better, better than I expected. Another one. I think it was Mike Bailey. It was right next to me, and he came out of the ring. He's like, "Yeah!" Like, try to get the crowd pumped up. I was, I was just like. Oh no, sir! You are going to lose. Trust the system. And I was, um, I was trash talking them every time they were on the ring, or outside the ring on the floor. I'm just like, like that's right, motherfucker. Trust the system. <laughs> so, I, w- I really did not want uh, Teabag Mountain to win this match. Um, I'm a system guy. I wanted to see them win this, and they did. I thought the the finish was really, really good. I thought. The roster cut into the Boston knee party was great, but overall, this match over delivered, in my opinion. 
Brian Myers was hurt in this match, so he wasn't clear to compete at the taping. But he will wrestle it under siege. He will wrestle it under siege. So don't even... Do not trip, my friends. Last man standing, Josh Alexander and Hammerstone. This was one of the better matches on the card. I thought Hammerstone was going to win. I wanted Hammerstone to win because I thought Hammerstone needed the win. Josh doesn't really need the win because you can have Josh lose 10 matches in a row and he can turn it on the very next one and be right back where he needs to be. That's that's how I kind of view Josh. I don't feel like he's someone that can get buried, you know? So I thought Hammerstone needed this. I expected him to win. I think they're they're transitioning to Josh wrestling without the the uh, headgear because in the match that he wrestled, and let me not get away get into that, but I think they're transitioning being done with the headgear. So I think that's a lot of the reason that um, that Hammerstone took it to begin with, and then Josh kind of had a couple impromptu matches where he was kind of dressed to wrestle, but you know. He didn't feel the need to go out and buy a new headset. So I don't think he's going to be wearing it anymore. He did not wear it during the tapings. I'm not going to get into it any, any deeper than that because it's not, it wasn't like a traditional match, but I don't think, I think he's done with it, but I know it's a legit safety measure for him. So um, I don't really know, but this was, this was one of the better, uh, the better matches of the night after a C4 spike on the outside. And, uh, you know, Hammerstone at this point needs uh, needs some momentum. I think he needs some momentum because he lost two out of these three matches. I think he needs a little bit of momentum. I'm reading here in the results that they played at Jonathan Gresham vid, uh, vignette. I don't believe we saw that in the arena. It says he morphed into a blend of all three of himself and then spit black ink to signify his octopus per persona and then Gresham had a new mask with the face of an octopus but he had a grill huh we, I don't think anyone knows where this is going with Jonathan Gresham but everyone's interested in it so we'll see we'll see we'll see the one match on the card that was an absolute stinker was the knockouts championship Jordan Grace taking on Steph Delander I foolishly called for Steph Delander to win this match it's idiotic of me. I thought that they just didn't have any more opponents for, for Grace. So I made the the I made the guess, I made the prediction that Steph Delander was gonna win this thing. This match was awful. Now we have to have some grace. We have to give them some grace. Matt Cardone was supposed to be involved here. He got injured. He wasn't cleared to travel, I don't believe. So they threw the good hands into that spot. So you already knew, okay, there's... You knew when the good hands came on screen, and and because it was so random, you just knew they were going to be involved. From what I was told, once Cardona was out of the picture, they had to do a last-minute rewrite, but didn't necessarily have the time to make sure it was going to work and come out smooth. All right. We're not in the industry, so we don't know how long it takes. We don't know how many run-throughs they need to do or how many run-throughs they run throughs they even do for certain matches. We're not privy to that information. So you might say, oh, well, there's there's plenty of time to, to figure this out. I am trusting that there wasn't. So I'm going to ask everyone to have some grace. The match was awful. Sucked my third nipple, but have some grace because this wasn't the way the match was supposed to play out. However, it did play out this way. And there was a point where Steph Double D Lander looked like she was going to win the championship. Uh, The good brother. So the goof ref Frank got taken out. At one point they threw him out of the ring and he hit that apron so hard. Everyone cheered. Because he was coming off like such a goof to the live audience. Like, how do you not see this stuff that's right in front of you? I mean, have they ever made a referee look worse than they make him look? 
But he was knocked out. I think it was Jason Hotch took his shirt off and then started counting three. And the lights went out. The lights went out, so we're getting our second surprise of the night, right? Guess who the fuck it is? PCO. When I was previewing Rebellion, I I meant to say this and I forgot. And I was going to say, I promise you, PCO will be on this card. They will find a way to put PCO on this card. And sure as shit, they did. 110% random. No connection to Matt Cardona, who he was going to attack. No connection to Steph Delander. No connection to Jordan Grace. No connection to the knockouts division. No connected connection to a woman. But he comes out. And guess who comes out next? Big Con. You're going to see a lot more Con going forward. We assumed he was out. Myself, Mike Gilbert, some of these other podcasters, when he went 0-3 versus PCO, we said that was his la- had to have been his last date. Why else would they waste our time? Khan is still here. Khan was at the tapings. Khan is a big part of the tape. Uh, let me not say he's a big part of the tapings. He's involved in one of the bigger angles. Khan comes out, and I don't, I don't know if it was just Matt Cardona, if it would have just been PCO, because I think they advertised that match. The good hands were there to take Matt Cardona's place, but Khan was also there to take his place. I think they used three people to take the place of one person, and it was a complete soup sandwich. And the crowd was having the life sucked out of them. It was so overbooked. And again, we have to have a little bit of grace given the situation, but that does not change the fact that a whole freaking lot went on because then the lights went out again and it was salami calorie the snack machine sammy callahan is back there were some who expected that he was coming back that they thought some of the teases could have been sammy callahan they also said that it would be kind of a dis- disappointment if he, if he was one of the returnees. But because they had Santana, because they had broken Mart- Mart- Matt at the end, I think it was okay to bring Sammy Callahan back. He has a lot of fans. He has a lot of supporters. He's going to be wrestling MLW and TNA, which is cool, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I was saying I think the future free agency is going to be people wrestling TNA, NWA, MLW like AJ Francis is, that's what I think the future is going to be. Um, but that does not stop the fact that after the lights went out, we got PCO, and then we got Khan, and then we got Sammy Callahan. I don't even remember how this damn match ended, barely. I know we got the juggernaut driver. Everything's a driver. We got a juggernaut driver, a backup referee who very conveniently ran out for the three count at that exact time. But this was a complete goat rope, uh, an absolute shit sandwich. But it was the only bad thing on the show. So I think people can live with it. And then the main event. This is what I thought was going to be the match of the night, and it was a good match, but it was not match of the night. Moose, the world champion taking on Nick Nemeth. The reason it did not live up to expectations for me and it wasn't the match of the night was it was, I don't know how it came off on TV. It was a little sloppy in person. There were some, there were some missed opportunity, missed spots. I, I hate saying botch because I'm, I could not do what they do, but for lack of better term, there were some botches. So this wasn't as good. I think as we, thought it would be Ryan Nemeth was in the crowd. I think their father might've been with them, but they had, man, they had all sorts of people 
on this show and they weren't necessarily involved in it, which is, which is good. It, it makes things not so predictable, but, um, Moose wins here. The spear was not hit very well. You would think someone like Nick Nemeth could take the shit out of a spear. It, it wasn't, it wasn't on point like that. But Nick Nemeth loses clean, clean as a whistle. Didn't really expect that coming. I actually felt bad for him. I, I genuinely felt bad. Like I don't, I don't know why. And then the lights go out again. We could see the silhouette in the dark. So like PCO came from under the ring. We were, we could see it was him too. The broken mat came from, from the the tunnel across the way. People knew it was him. You could see his fro, in the uh, in, in the shadows. And it was broken Matt Hardy. They can't allow Moose to celebrate anything. This dude wins a big match, celebrates, and gets attacked by someone and wants his championship. The, the system for the longest time was telling him, turn around, turn around, turn around. And this dude was not turning around. Finally, he did. And yeah, it's broken Matt. Broken Matt can be a lot of fun. I th- they're, I've read they're supposed to do House Hardy stuff and, you know, um, the stuff they got over the first time that was popular. But there's a possibility that this is EC3, the EC, the second EC3 run to where you get hyped up for it and it's and it's nothing, a big nothing burger. There's potential here, but I do think he's going to be around longer than that. He has not signed with the company. Everyone's favor, right? The, the handshake deals. Handshake deal. I, I hope he's not like the EC3 return, but I, it was pretty exciting to see him. There was, there was some great surprises on this episode. There was a lot of big-time names involved with it. It was overall good. I, I couldn't tell you if I liked it more than Hard to Kill or not. I'm not really sure. I would lean towards yes, and Rebellion is the D show. It It is the D pay-per-view. It is the one that has the least amount of effort put into it. So if you like this show, I think you're going to love Slammiversary. I think you're going to love Bound for Glory. Like that's a good sign that they put so much into this because it is the fourth priority. I don't think anyone can can argue that. But great job, TNA. Great pay-per-view. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, the The set of tapings was very, very solid afterwards. There were some good matches there. I don't know the storylines. They're definitely 90% of them being built backstage. So there's a lot of bumping into each other, I would imagine. But I don't necessarily know what the stories were. I know some of the under siege matches, um, but that's about it. But Rebellion, great show, great pay-per-view. You've got a couple months till Slammiversary to save up your funds. So don't don't get on Twitter and say, I got fired. Um, by a place that fires nobody, and, and I need your money. I need your help. I need your guidance. Don't be that dude, okay? I'm your boy, BQ. Thanks for checking me out. I will talk to you next time. I have a very, very busy week ahead of me, so I might get one piece of content out, um, but that's probably it. it it's kind of it's a crazy week for me. I'm not even going to be in the state. I'll be uh, back home in Illinois for a couple of days. I call three places home, California, Illinois, Nevada. Florida is the only state I've lived in that's not home to me. But I make places home, so everything's home. I guess Florida's kind of home. Whatever, I'm just rambling. Thanks for checking me out. I'm your boy, BQ. We'll talk soon. Peace.